Hey guys, it's Frank Spear back with you today. I want to do another video on the trees of the Bible. Not another video on the trees, but another video. And this one will be on the trees. I'm a huge Rush fan. Love the band Rush. I have since high school. And uh, my wife Lisa is also. And I want to read you the lyrics to a song they have called The Trees. It's from the 70s, right? There is unrest in the forest. There's trouble with the trees, for the maples want more sunlight, and the oaks ignore their pleas. The trouble with the maples is they're quite convinced they're right. They say the oaks are just too lofty, and they grab up all the light. But the oaks can't help their feelings if they like the way they're made, and they wonder why the maples can't be happy in their shade. There's trouble in the forest and the creatures all have fled and the maples scream oppression and the oaks just shake their heads. So the maples formed a union and demanded equal rights. The oaks are just too greedy. We will make them give us light. Now there's no more oak oppression for they passed a noble law and the trees are all kept equal by hatchet, ax, and saw how biblical of them of these can of this canadian power trio <laughs> uh ezekiel 31 wait till we get into this in this particular passage uh, this is a judgment a warning to pharaoh king of egypt and to assyria one of the local nations in that area at the time this is some 700 years before Jesus. Here we go. I'm going to just read through the passage and we're going to highlight things as we go. In the 11th year, in the third month, on the first of the month, the word of the Lord came to me, Ezekiel, who was a prophet among Israel, saying this, Son of man. So the Israelites are called the son of men. Son of man. Jesus called himself the son of man. Son of man, say to the Pharaoh, king of Egypt, Say to the Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to his hordes, his armies, whom are like you in greatness? Now, they were mighty, Egypt. Who's like you in greatness? Behold, Assyria, another mighty nation, Assyria was a cedar tree in Lebanon. Was Assyria, was Assyria a literal tree? Of course not. So let's get that out of the way right at the get-go, okay? Symbolism, metaphor. Behold, Assyria was a cedar in Lebanon, right? Saying to Pharaoh, you're a great nation. But remember, Assyria was a mighty cedar tree in Lebanon. With beautiful branches and forest shade. And very high did its top reach even into the clouds. The clouds, very biblical. Clouds pop up all over the place. Jesus said he was coming in the clouds. Here, Ezekiel says that the top of Assyria, was it was such a mighty cedar tree that its top reached all the way into the clouds. It was mightier than everyone else. It was the nation with the most powerful armies. Everyone submitting to it. Great tree. Verse 4, the waters made it grow. The waters made it high, made it grow higher and higher. Well, waters in the Bible all throughout are peoples. So the more peoples that came into Assyria, the more it grew, the more mighty it became, the, the taller the tree grew. Watch, with its rivers continually extended all around its planting place. That sounds like the Garden of Eden, right? With the four rivers intertwining and meeting in there and all the trees of the field. And all these rivers continually extended all around and sent out its channels to all the trees of the field. Well, if Assyria is a mighty cedar tree, then who are all the trees of the field? Well, they're all the other nations around it. We'll see that as we go on. Verse 5, therefore its height was loftier than all the trees of the field, and its bows became many and its branches grew long because of many waters as it spread out its branches 
Here we come, ready? And all the birds of the air nested in its branches, and the beasts of the field gave birth under its branches. All the great nations lived under its shade. Wow. Matthew 13, 32. Jesus says that the kingdom of God would grow and all the birds of the air would come and dwell in its branches. This is talking about a kingdom. That's talking about a kingdom. Birds of the air are people in the parable. Birds of the air are people here in this vision and this oracle. Trees, birds, beasts of the field, rivers, waters. Sounds like Genesis. One, two, three. Verse 7. So it was beautiful in its greatness, in the length of its branches, for its roots extended to many waters. Right? Assyria was, it's sort of like the United States in a way, right? Our branches reach out around the world. We help people around the world. Now, I'm not getting political. Okay? I don't want to get political. But Assyria was the greatest nation at that time. And it was extending itself in many ways to the other trees in the garden. The trees of the field. And the birds of the air and the beasts of the field were living in its shade. They were benefiting from it. Getting protection from Assyria. So forth and so on. Okay? Verse 8. The cedars in God's garden could not match this tree. Assyria. The cedars in God's garden, the people of Israel, the tribes of Israel, their nations could not match Assyria. As a matter of fact, Assyria conquered Israel. The cypress tree could not compare its branches. And the P-L-A-N-E, the plane trees could not match its branches. So there are different kinds of trees here. What does God say to Adam? Of all the trees of the garden you may eat, you may covenant with. But not this one tree. That you may not enter into covenant with. If you do, you'll die. You'll be out of covenant with me. That's covenant. It's law. It's covenant death. It's the ministry of death that Paul talked about. Now watch this. Remember Paul in Romans 10? I think it's 10. Maybe it's 11. 10 or 11 talking about Israel as an olive tree. And that the Gentiles would be grafted into that olive tree. Jesus told the parable of planting the, the gospel in Israel, spreading the gospel, and said that the seed, the gospel, will be planted in the earth, in the ground, in the land of Israel, in the Holy Land. But the birds of the air would come and snatch up the seed. Who were the birds of the air? The birds of the air were the rulers of Judea, the apostate leaders over the people of Judah, over the Jews. And they came and they snatched away the seed. They persecuted the Christians. They persecuted Christ. Then they persecuted his followers. No tree in the garden of God could compare with the beauty of the great cedar tree. That is Assyria. I made it beautiful, God says. I'm responsible for what happened to Assyria. I did it. God working among the foreigners. At least in this way. Right? He's ordering, organizing everything that went on around Israel. Watch this. I made, it, I made it beautiful with its multiple branches. And all the trees of Eden, which were in the garden of God, were jealous of it. So God says that Israel and all of the tribes and all of his people, God's peculiar, peculiar people, Israel, all those trees in the garden of God were jealous of the great cedar tree of Assyria because of its prosperity, because of its strength, because of its greatness, which God promised he would give to Israel if they remained faithful to him, but they did not. Verse 10 of Ezekiel 31, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because it is high in stature and has its top among the clouds, it's the greatest. It's the best. It's number one. Everybody else bows to the great tree in Lebanon, the great cedar tree, Assyria. But because its heart became haughty and proud, 
Therefore, I will give it into the hand of a despot, the despot of the nations, and he will thoroughly deal with it. An enemy is coming against Assyria and is going to conquer it. According to its wickedness, I have driven it out. Whoa, 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 whoa. What did God do to Adam, one of the trees of the garden? He drove him out of Eden. Because of what? His wickedness. Because he covenanted with another tree that he wasn't supposed to eat from, fellowship with. So I will drive this, I will drive, I will destroy this tree and drive it away. Now watch this, verse 12. Alien tyrants, foreign people, foreign nations, a foreign mighty nation will come, watch, of the nations, and it will cut it down. And I will leave it on the mountains, and in all the valleys I will lay its branches which have fallen, and its boughs which have been broken, and all the ravines in the land. And all the peoples of the earth, or the land, have gone down from its shade and left its shade. Wow! Look, hold on, let's flip over here to John. Chapter 7, for a minute here. I'm sorry, um, Matthew, chapter 7, verses 15 to 53. I'm losing it. Matthew, chapter 7, verses 15 through 23. Watch this. Let's start at 13. Enter through the narrow gate. Jesus is telling them, come into the kingdom, but it's narrow. Enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and broad that leads to destruction. There are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. Adam died out of covenant with God. Israel was out of covenant with God ever since. They had a covenant, but they were out of the original covenant that Adam was in with God before the fall. Adam, in the day that you partake, that you eat, that you fellowship with this tree in the garden, that you join yourselves to them, whatever that meant, you will surely die. You'll be out of this covenant out of Eden. And God made another covenant, a different covenant with them. You see, he made a covenant with Adam, made a covenant with Noah, made a covenant with Abraham, made a covenant with the 12 tribes and so forth, made a covenant with Moses. Then Christ came and turned around what happened in that garden. I've talked about that in other videos. Now watch this, Matthew seven fifteen. Beware of the false prophets. Beware of the Jews, the Israelites among you who are anti-Christ, who are against Christ and against his people, who are not entering by the narrow gate, who are not going to come into the new kingdom, who are not going to be a part of the new community of God. These are serpents, like in Eden. These are false prophets. John the Baptist called these false prophets serpents. He called, Jesus called them serpents, vipers. Watch this. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Fruits, Genesis 1, 16, fruit. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit. But bad trees bear bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Back to Ezekiel 31. What did we just read? Verse 12 of Ezekiel 31. Alien tyrants of the nations will cut you down. And leave your branches scattered. Well, who was Jesus talking about? What tree would be cut down? This is AD 70. These are the apostate Jews. This is Jerusalem. The destruction of Jerusalem. And the Jewish peoples. And the Israelites that were gathered together with them. For the feasts. When it all went down. In that first century. And they were destroyed. Cut down. The city of God destroyed and a new city of God instituted. Hebrews chapter 12. 
Let's finish up here in Ezekiel 31. Verse 13. On its ruin, Assyria, once it's destroyed, on its ruin, all the birds of the heavens will live. So these other nations, these other mighty peoples are going to move in and live in the land that Assyria had. They're going to conquer and take over like the Romans had with first century, first century Judah and Palestine. And the Romans had conquered and they were occupying the land, oppressing the people of God who were living in their holy land. They had come into their holy land like demons and had infiltrated the holy land and needed to be cast out. And in the new kingdom, the people of God would no longer be oppressed by the Romans. They would be a new people, no longer under Roman occupation in a sense. They would, the Christians would scatter out and live all over the world. The people of God would no longer be concentrated in one geographical locale in Palestine. The holy land of Israel would be destroyed and no longer be the holy land of Israel. Israel would be cast out of their own land. Jesus came to fulfill everything that had to do with them. Sum it up. I came to fulfill all the law and the prophets, Jesus said. Daniel said, there will be 70 weeks given for your people for all things to be fulfilled, to make an end of the sin of Israel, to finish it. Jesus came and took away the sin of Israel. 490 years, Daniel, 70 years, that's 70 weeks of years, right? Each year counts as seven years, 70 years, 490 years. That's when Messiah came and summed everything for Israel up the end. They were over as God's holy people. And a new people was formed, a new people of God, where there's no longer Jew, no longer Gentile, no longer slave, no longer free, no longer male, no longer female, no slave, barbarian, Scythian. There, these distinctions were gone. Those were distinctions under Israelite law, and they went away. That law was Adam's death. Paul called the law the ministry of death, the ministry of condemnation. Israel was dead in their trespasses and sins like Adam who started it all. Jesus, Paul calls the second Adam, came and, 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 and reversed the curse, if you will. Took away the curse. And now it's back to Eden where the tree of life shows up again in Revelation 22. Oh man, okay. Verse 15 of Ezekiel 31. Watch this. Oh, let's go verse 14. So all the trees by the waters will no longer be exalted in Assyria, nor will they set their top among the clouds anymore, nor their well-watered mighty ones stand under the height of that great cedar tree anymore. Watch this. For they have all, that is the Assyrians, been given over to death. That sounds like Adam. They've been cut off. They've been brought low. They've died. Well, not all the Assyrians died here when they came and were conquered. They didn't all literally die. Assyria went on. But they were deposed. They were cut down. They entered into a kind of death. Watch this. Verse 15, thus says the Lord God, on the day when it went down to Sheol, Assyria, the cedar tree, went down to Sheol, to the grave. I caused lamentations over it. I closed the deep over it, the waters, and held back its rivers from flowing anymore. And its many waters were clogged up, stopped up, and I made Lebanon mourn for it. And all the trees of the field wilted, on account of it. Well, they no longer had Assyria to protect it. They no longer had Assyria to trade with and bargain with and all the goods and services and so forth and so on and all that that entailed. This sounds like Revelation 18. Read Revelation 18 after Jerusalem was destroyed. Well, read Revelation 18. These are conquerings of nations, folks. The trees, the birds of the field, I mean, the birds of the air, the beasts of the field are plainly here, plainly. You, it's non-negotiable, are talking about peoples. Watch this, verse 16. I made the nations quake at the sound of its fall. There was a great war. The earth quaked. 
Just like when Jesus said he would return, right? He came where? In the clouds. Assyria was a tree reaching into the clouds, the mightiest of the mighty. Jesus said he would come on the clouds, in the clouds. Well, he came in the Roman army. He came in the Roman army, the greatest nation in the world at that time. He came in a war and destroyed the people of Israel. Wow. Those are the clouds Jesus came on. He came on the clouds or in the clouds. When Rome came in that war from 66 to 70 and annihilated the land of God, the people of God, the city of God, the temple of God, the priesthood of God, because a new was being instituted, a new people of God that consisted of all peoples on the globe. The, door, the gates of the city were flung wide open in the New Jerusalem, Revelation chapter 21. When, that, when those Roman armies came, Jesus says, I would be coming on those clouds to sum it all up, to bring it to its conclusion. That's the parousia, the coming, the presence of God. We see this kind of language used, being used all throughout the Old Testament when there were wars and God was destroying a certain people by bringing another nation against them. It says he's coming in the clouds, he's coming in the clouds. It means he's coming with th that nation and he would come with all his mighty angels. The word angels is messengers, servants, the Roman armies. They were doing his bidding. They were serving him. They were destroying Jerusalem and Judea and Palestine and those people and the temple and the priesthood. They were doing it. They were his mighty angels, his servants coming. He was riding on those clouds. That was his second coming. Go back again to Ezekiel 31. Right? It, we, we read before that it says that God planted that tree of Assyria. This was his doing. He was involved with those nations. Same thing with Rome. They were his mighty messengers doing his bidding whenever he decided they would. God is in control of what's going on on this chessboard. He would return in the clouds with his mighty angels and gather together his elect from the four winds from the Roman Empire. Gather together his elect and collect them up into one new body. That's the harvest. Right? This is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 17. To meet the Lord in the air, in the heavenly places. It says the cedar tree rose up into the heavens, into the clouds, into the air. Its tops were above all the other trees. Jesus, Jesus was now coming in the clouds, right? In this mighty Roman uh, empire. And he was destroying the old theocracy of Israel and instituting a new people of God that would be mightier than even the Roman Empire. More in number, greater in people, greater in power. The Roman Empire fell 300 years later. Where is the Roman Empire today? Where are the people of God today? Still here. More in number than any nation on the planet. Mightier. Remember Daniel's vision of the statue and the four empires. And then he said, and I saw a small stone come rolling along and smash, and it got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And it smashed into those four empires and destroyed them all. And it, it, it grew and grew and grew and became greater than all nations on the earth. This is the kingdom that was instituted in AD 70. When the old was gone, there was no longer any old. You couldn't come into the old anymore. No mosaic law, no temple, no priesthood. Gone. Never to return. But the kingdom of God instituted by Jesus, right? As he summed up all those things, he turned the kingdom over to the Father. Boom! A new kingdom of God. A new theocracy. With no Jew, no Gentile, etc. Wow! A new mighty tree. Greater than all the trees in the garden. These are nations. People groups. Beasts of the field. Birds of the air. The grass. The grass? Yeah. The green things in Genesis. In Revelation it says not to destroy the green things for a certain period of time. Then it would be okay to destroy the green things. 
Now, does that change things when Jesus says, look at the birds of the air. They don't toil or spin, but your heavenly father clothes them and feeds them. These are their rulers, right? The priesthood received their income, their livelihood from the people of Israel who gave tithes and they lived off that. Look at the birds of the air. Look at your rulers. They don't go out and plow fields. They don't have to work like you do. The heavens and the earth, Israel, the rulers and the peoples, the heavens and the earth. This tree rose up into the heavens, mightier than the other trees. I, I hope you see how this all comes together. When you see this, it's everywhere, everywhere. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven would be like a mustard seed planted in the ground would grow up into a great tree. John the Baptist said, the axe has already laid root at the tree of Israel. You brood of vipers, you serpents. Serpents, trees, Genesis. Serpents, trees, John the Baptist. Serpents, trees, Jesus. It rose up many than greater. Oh, I don't want to get too All right, let's finish this up. Okay, here we go. Verse 16, I made the nations quake. The sound of its fall. Right? This is the great cedar tree falling and the nations quaked. No, this isn't literal, obviously. But when Assyria went down, the nations that surrounded it that were receiving benefit from it in one way or another trembled, quaked. Uh-oh, what are we going to do now? Somebody else is conquered. And what will our relationship be like with this new conqueror? This is what it means. You see that falling, quaked, earthquake language all through the New Testament. Okay, let's do this. Let's go to Hebrews if you will, with me. Chapter 12, talking about the new Jerusalem being instituted, an invisible kingdom that would not be made with hands, that is, the church of God, the new kingdom of God that Jesus said was coming, was coming, was coming. Then the 40-year Acts period, basically, I'll call it the Acts period, lasted. The old was destroyed completely. They were transitioning into it. The old was destroyed completely. The new came and the new lasts forever. It's that little stone that became the giant rock. That goes on and on. Daniel tells us in his prophetic visions that this will be an everlasting kingdom. Isaiah says it will be an everlasting kingdom. That kingdom didn't have any end. The New Testament talks about that kingdom's beginning. And then it, it's over. It's done. There's no more revelation. No more to say about it. Because all Israelite scripture was summed up. In Christ, finished, I came to fulfill all that was written in the law and the prophets. The end of it. When that ended, this ended. And we've been living in the garden with God. The trees of the field have been living in the garden with God ever since. Back to the pre-fall Adam condition. Where you simply believe by faith, by grace, and trust in God and His goodness. And you behave yourself in a way that God lays out in this book. What He wants from the heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. Bear one another's burdens. Be kind-hearted towards one another. Where are all the rules and the laws laid down for Christians? We have rules and laws laid down during the transition period when they were coming out of the old kingdom and into the new, but they were still living in that transferal period. Coming out of the law and all of those things and struggling. Should we be? Shouldn't we? Do we do live like this now? No, you got to live like that. No, that's gone. No, and they were fighting through it. But then by AD 70, you couldn't go back because it was gone. There wasn't anything. There wasn't anything left to go back to. Where's the temple? Where are the priests? Where are the animal sacrifices? Where's all the furniture in the temple? Where's our holy city? Where's our holy land? That's why it was destroyed. That's why it had to end. So the new could begin. Without those things. That's the whole point of the book of Hebrews. It's saying those things were pointers to something new that was coming that wouldn't have these things in a physical form. That's why Second Peter chapter 3 and other parts of Peter's writing say that these, those temporary things, those elemental things, those elementary things, those ABC things that lasted from Adam to Jesus were going to burn up 
and be gone and something completely new was coming. The heavenly Jerusalem coming down from heaven, out, out of heaven from God. And God would now tabernacle among men, right? Not just in Jerusalem, in one little geographical locale on planet Earth to say, there's where the presence of God is, right in there, inside that building, behind that curtain. God lives there, right there. Done. That's why the temple veil ripped in two when Jesus was crucified, signifying God's presence had left the building. God was doing something new now. There's a new kingdom for him to be involved in. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Creation? That sounds like Genesis 1. Well, it is. Look at John 1.1. 1, 1. John, the gospel, is describing the new creation, the new kingdom. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. And light came into the world and came into the darkness. And the darkness tried to extinguish it, but it couldn't. And on and on. Light and darkness? That sounds like Genesis 1. Beasts of the field, plants of the ground, trees bearing fruit, sun, moon, and stars. That sounds like Genesis 1. Joseph had a dream that the sun, moon, and stars were bowing down to him. Israel, all throughout the Old Testament, is called the sun, moon, and stars. When Joseph's family, his 12 brothers, his 11 brothers, and his parents heard his dream, he said, what, are we going to bow down to you? They understood they were the sun, moon, they were the sun, the moon, and stars. All through the Old Testament, right, what does God say about Israel? He says, I will make you as numerous as the stars in the sky. Let's finish this up, then I want to say something quickly about that, and we'll wrap it up for today. Now watch this. Back to Ezekiel 31. And I made the nations quake at the sound of its fall, Assyria, when it fell. When I made it go down to Sheol, to the grave, it died. Assyria died. And it's personifying it here, in a sense. He's personifying the tree, or saying that tree died and went down to Sheol, to the grave, Right? with those who go down to the pit. And all the well-watered trees of Eden, the choicest and the best trees of Lebanon, were comforted in the land. Watch this. They also went down, watch this, they also went down with Assyria to Sheol, to those who were slain by the sword. So Sheol is those who were slain by the sword, right? This is Assyria and the Assyrians who died in the war when the invader came and conquered Assyria. Watch this. And, the, uh, uh, and all those who were slain by the sword and those who were its strength lived under its shade among the nations. I, there's so much to say about this. I'm just trying to make a larger point. Watch this last verse, verse 18. To which among the trees of Eden are you thus equal in glory and greatness, Pharaoh? Remember, in the beginning, he's talking here to Pharaoh. Watch this. To which among the trees of Eden are you thus equal in glory and greatness? I'm sorry, I messed up there. He's talking about Assyria. Easy to get lost among the trees of the forest here. He's talking to Assyria. He talks about it being destroyed. Then he says this to it rhetorically. Basically, now which among the trees in Eden are you equal to in greatness now? You're destroyed. Yet, you will be brought down with the trees of Eden to the earth beneath. You will lie in the midst of the uncircumcised, the foreigners, watch this, with those who were slain by the sword. So is Pharaoh and all his hordes, declares the Lord. Now, there are things that I'm saying that you're saying, but wait a minute, what does that mean? I'm not unpacking every verse here. In order to do that, I have to back up and go through every verse again and lay out what's exactly going on in terms of the nations. That's not my point here today. My point was the trees. You see who they are. Now, there are some who say, oh yeah, 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 that's true. These are definitely figurative, symbolic, metaphor, representing nations, and the beasts of the field are representing peoples, no question, and the birds of the air are, re are representing rulers, yeah, and all of that, that's true. But Genesis is the real thing. 
Those really were literal birds in the air and trees in the field with fruit. And God was actually concerned that Adam would eat a piece of fruit or not eat a piece of fruit. That's true. And, 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 and the waters are literal waters. And the sun, moon, and stars is literal stars there. And then throughout the rest of the Bible, they make reference to the literal in symbolic ways. But Genesis 1 is literal. Well, let me ask you this. In Revelation 21, is the tree of life literal or figurative? In the new kingdom of God, right? In the new kingdom of God, in today's church, okay? The tree of life is there, Revelation 21 says. Well, where is that? Where is that literally geographically located? Because I got to say, I haven't been eaten from its fruit. And if, if I need to eat from that fruit to have eternal life, I'm in trouble. Where is that tree? Of course, I'm being sarcastic, right? It's not literal. So I have some friends who would say, my Bible studying friends, who would say, oh no, that's figurative, of course. So wait a minute. Everything in Genesis 1 through 3 is literal, but yet the tree of life is in Genesis. But the tree of life in Eden, when it returns in Revelation 22, is figurative. But when it's in Eden, it was literal. The serpent was a literal talking snake, I guess. But when Jesus calls them serpents, he's just referring to that talking, literal talking snake. Who then, when God cursed it, took away its legs and it's crawled on its belly. I can't get there, folks, but I was there for most of my life. But I, as you read through the Bible over and over and over, which I am afraid many, 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 the majority, the vast majority of Bible uh, people who call themselves Christians or Bible believers don't do. They read their favorite passages. They listen to preachers. They read books about the Bible. But well, I pastored a church for 17 years and I was involved in church ministry for many years before that. And I know from my experience, and I bet you can verify this as well, that the majority of church-going people never read the Bible. And if they do, they just go to their favorite little verse a day keeps the devil away passages. But they don't read through it. And read. You, you stop any churchgoer, walk into any church on Sunday morning, say, give me the gist of Hosea. Give me the gist of Obadiah. Give me the gist of Isaiah. Give me the gist of Judges. They, they can't do it. So they never connect these dots. The only way you're ever going to connect these dots is reading it over and over and becoming saturated with the content of the scripture. Then you start going, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. I do not believe that Genesis 1 is the literal creation of the universe. I believe that Genesis 1 is the same thing as John 1. It was the creation of a covenant people of God and their covenant system. 